Hi, my name is Kristen Wands, and I'm the curator here at Windsor Historical Society. I'm standing here in our exhibition gallery in our relatively new exhibition, Windsor in 1921, The Paradox of Progress. And the premise of this exhibition is to look at what life was like in Windsor in the year 1921. What did the town look like? What were people excited about? What kinds of challenges were the town facing at the time? So, um, we hope that by looking at the photographs and artifacts and hearing the stories of, of life in 1921, it will give you a really strong sense of what Windsor was like then compared to how it is now, 100 years later. And many of you might be thinking, why 1921? Well, that's because 1921 was the year that Windsor Historical Society was founded. And next year, in September of 2021, we will be celebrating our 100th anniversary as a historical society, which is something we're very excited about. And so we wanted to look at the conditions of life in town under which the historical society was founded, and to look at how those ideals of life in Windsor in 1921 contributed to the ideals under which the historical society was created. So we hope you'll enjoy. Why 1921? Windsor Historical Society was founded in September of 1921 as a membership organization of 17 people. Next year, 2021, will mark the Society's 100th anniversary, when we will present an exhibition celebrating the Society's founding. As a prequel to that exhibition, this one examines what life was like in Windsor in 1921. How have things changed, and how have they stayed the same? How did the conditions of life in Windsor in 1921 influence the ideals under which the Windsor Historical Society was founded? Through this exhibition, and the next, we celebrate the Society's successes of the past 100 years, but also look toward the future. How must the Society evolve to meet the challenges and reflect the history of Windsor and its people in 2021 and beyond? The Wider World in 1921 a year of turmoil. War, sickness, and recession shaped people's lives across the globe. The world was still recovering from World War I. Returning soldiers had flooded back into the labor force, and people were still feeling the aftereffects of the Spanish flu pandemic, which had rippled through the world's population in waves between 1918 and 1920. These factors had triggered a recession, known as the Depression of 1920 to 1921. The world struggled to regain its footing after the turmoil of war and sickness. This downturn was minor compared to the rapid economic growth of the Roaring Twenties, which occurred between 1921 and the Great Depression in 1929. adjusting to change. People embraced new technologies, but struggled to adapt to transformations caused by immigration, industry, and new laws. The Industrial Revolution brought rapid change in the previous decades. By 1921, people's lives were impacted by widespread use of electricity and automobiles. Motion pictures became popular and changed the face of entertainment. Waves of immigrants seeking a better life had altered the cultural fabric and increased the competition for jobs, housing, and other resources. 1920 brought further change with the 18th Amendment, prohibiting the consumption of alcohol, and the 19th Amendment, allowing women the right to vote. So many adjustments could feel overwhelming. People embraced progress while also longing for simpler times. A new U.S. President. Woodrow Wilson's successful reforms of banking and business, followed by Warren G. Harding's promise of a return to pre-World War I normalcy, created a sense of optimism for Americans. In the United States, Woodrow Wilson's presidency was coming to an end. He had led the nation since 1913. Wilson has been widely praised for his leadership during World War I, 
as well as for his new freedom domestic agenda, which included far-reaching reforms of tariffs, banking, and business. Notably, these reforms created both the Federal Reserve and antitrust laws enacted through the Clayton and Federal Trade Commission Acts. He has been criticized, on the other hand, for policies that expanded racial segregation within government departments. Warren G. Harding's presidency began in March of 1921. His front porch campaign, conducted from his own home in Marion, Ohio, as well as his promise of a return to pre-war normalcy, won him incredible popularity and contributed to an overall sense of optimism. In 1921, people did not yet know about the Teapot Dome scandal, his extramarital affair, or that he would die in office in 1923. Daily Life in Windsor in 1921 An Overview Windsor remained prosperous, improved its infrastructure, and adapted to new technologies like cars and movies, but struggled to keep up with the demands of its quickly growing population. Windsor showed few signs of the recession faced by the larger world in 1921. Despite one report of slow business, the Hartford Current stated that hunting license sales were at a record high in town because business was stagnant. The town remained prosperous. In 1921, Windsor brought in $7.6 million in taxes compared to the $4.8 million it had earned in 1914. The town was able to spend money to improve sewers, sidewalks, and schools, and it voted to allow charitable organizations to show motion pictures at Town Hall. A dedicated movie theater did not open in town until 1922. It purchased new road equipment, including a Kranz EL Monarch tractor, at a cost of $3,150. Nonetheless, Windsor struggled to meet the demands of its rapidly increasing population. The need for more schools and more, better qualified teachers had plagued the town for years. Windsor residents faced a bit of a paradox in 1921. They welcomed modernity, but not always the changes that came with it. Five modes of transportation, including a train, a trolley, an automobile, a cyclist, and a pedestrian, converge to create a death trap. In spite of Windsor's difficulty in keeping up with the demands of its increasing population and newer modes of transportation like automobiles and trolleys, the town made some progress in updating its infrastructure. In 1916, this 90-degree hairpin turn under the railroad bridge on Palisado Avenue, known at the time as the Death Trap, was straightened. It cost $100,000, split between the town, the state, the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad Company, and the Hartford and Springfield Railway Company, which ran the trolley. Traveling through Windsor's downtown became much safer as a result. Prohibition in Windsor. Like other U.S. communities, Windsor coped with prohibition. The town went dry in 1914 and remained so until 1933, but violations were rampant. Constable Maurice Kennedy kept busy disposing of alcohol and equipment like stills. Prohibition forced businesses, such as the bar at the Hotel Windsor, to close, and bartenders had to find work elsewhere. Alcoholics, including some discussed in the Historical Society's oral history collection, sometimes resorted to drinking rubbing alcohol, often with dire consequences. Women's suffrage in Windsor. In Windsor, women could vote since the 1890s, but the August 1920 vote approving the 19th Amendment to the Constitution and assuring white American women the right to vote was still big news. The state of Connecticut amended its own constitution in keeping with these federal changes in September 1920. Leading up to this, Windsor had its own suffragist movement. One leader was Agnes G. McCormick, shown here probably around 1900. She was actively involved in many local organizations, like the Windsor Emergency Aid Association during World War I, the Library Board, 
and Eastern Star. In 1915, she spoke at the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association's annual convention in Hartford on behalf of the Windsor Equal Franchise League, for which she served as president. She brought the case for suffrage in Windsor to the convention. Windsor Women's Voter Book, 1920. In the first election after the 19th Amendment passed, Windsor maintained a separate list of women who were eligible to vote. Of the 151 women who were eligible, 101 voted, including Agnes McCormick. Later, she made even more local history by becoming the first woman on the ballot as a candidate for town representative in 1930. People and more people. Immigration caused a dramatic increase in Windsor's population. While the 1920 United States federal census shows nationwide populations shifting away from rural agricultural areas towards cities, Windsor's population had grown rapidly in the years just prior to 1921, in spite of its agricultural roots. The town's population had hovered around 3,000 throughout the 18th and early 19th century. The population hit 3,600 by 1900, but surged to 5,600 by 1920. This drastic population increase was driven in large part by immigrants drawn by the opportunity to work not only in the region's agriculture, but also in the mills and factories that sprung up along the Farmington River. Windsor became home to immigrants from Lithuania, Ireland, Italy, Poland, Austria, and elsewhere. A larger population meant progress, more tax revenue, and increased manufacturing for Windsor, but it also created tensions among residents. More people, more tensions. For the most part, the disparate groups coexisted peacefully alongside Windsor's old guard white residents and black families, some of whom had also lived in town for generations. Not surprisingly, however, there were some tensions, particularly along racial lines or when people perceived threats to their livelihoods or cultural norms. 19th century immigrant groups like Irish and Scandinavians held prominent town offices, but members of more recent immigrant groups appear to have faced greater suspicion. Windsor's town medical examiner, H.F. King, appeared to blame recent immigrants for outbreaks of infectious disease and a decline in morality when he wrote, Some of the new development tracks, so-called, still constitute an active menace to health and morals and there seems to be no way of effectually controlling them under the present laws. In Windsor, as elsewhere in the country, people pushed immigrants to adopt traditional American values. Americanization protected the interests of native-born or established Americans above those of recent immigrants. Adherents blame immigrants for many societal ills. Americanization focused on teaching immigrants to become more American and assimilate American values. More recently, some criticized the movement as indoctrination that devalued immigrants' native cultures and made them seem dangerous. Americanization was a hot topic in Connecticut in the years around 1921. In July of 1919, state Americanization director Robert C. Deming surveyed the state and divided the towns into four classes based on his perceived need for Americanization work there. He determined that around two-thirds of the state required some attention toward Americanization. Interestingly, Deming rated Windsor a Class Three town, requiring little Americanization. In late March of 1919, the Hartford Current ran a story with the headline, Fines for Bad Boys in Windsor, Americanization Needed in People's Homes. The constable had been called to Griffin's school, associated with Griffin's tobacco plantation, because of some unruly immigrant boys who were charged with truancy and breach of peace. Americanization was touted as a solution to the problem. Proponents formed the Woodland Club at Griffin School as a response. Some Windsor residents jumped into action in support of Americanization efforts. The Daughters of the American Revolution, or DAR, formed an Americanization Committee in 1919, and the Windsor Businessmen's Association formed its own in 1920. By mid-1920, school superintendent 
and soon founding member of the new Windsor Historical Society, Daniel Howard gave lectures at local schools about the movement. In 1921, the town held an Americanization pageant featuring international performances from its participants. As part of Windsor's Americanization efforts, workers from the Young Women's Christian Association, or YWCA, in Hartford, came to Windsor in the fall of 1920 to organize a club for young women of foreign parentage whose homes were on or near the Griffin Tobacco Plantation on the west side of Windsor. The group enjoyed a variety of activities, including games, singing, and learning household arts such as sewing. But the true aim of the project was to teach the girls and their families to be good Americans. The 23 girls met every Wednesday evening at Griffin School, a one-room school on Prospect Hill Road near the Bloomfield Line. The YWCA hoped to form similar clubs in Wilson Station, Pequannock, Rainbow, and in the Cook Hill District. The 1920 census shows us that residents of various ethnic backgrounds all lived together in the same Windsor neighborhoods. 1920 was a federal census year, and this census data gives us a wonderful picture of the people who lived and worked in Windsor at that time. Many people continued to live on family farms, as they had for centuries, but the rapid increase in population required new housing solutions. For example, the Hartford Current reported in 1920 that Maple Avenue would be extended, new cross streets added there, and a new school built to accommodate housing for the town's growing population. Newcomers often lived in apartment buildings, sometimes called tenements, or private homes and farms. European immigrant families were somewhat more widely dispersed through town than black families, but there was a high degree of overlap in the neighborhoods where these groups resided. In 1922, Windsor's black population was relatively small. Though some black families were new to town as a result of suburbanization, their numbers were far outpaced by the rate of immigration of white Europeans. Black families made up only around 3 or 4 percent of Windsor's overall population in the 1920s, compared to about 39 percent today. From oral histories conducted with black residents, including Lenora Jubri, Irene Caesar, and Lois Niles Scott, who grew up in Windsor during the late 1910s and early 1920s. We know that black families understood there were certain neighborhoods they were welcome to live in and other neighborhoods they were discouraged from living in. The 1920 census shows many black families lived in neighborhoods around Cook Hill Road and Hayden Station. Their homes were interspersed among the homes of white residents of both English and European descent. Sometimes, our interviewees remembered, white and black children played together. Other times, they remembered tensions. An Italian immigrant spitting on the floor of a childhood apartment, or Polish immigrants who yelled racial epithets at them. Mostly, they said, black families kept to themselves. But they lived, worked, and attended schools and churches alongside their white neighbors. The Niles family, shown in the accompanying photo and page from the 1920 census, are an excellent case study to illustrate the mixed nature of black neighborhoods in 1920s Windsor. Susan M. Niles, the widowed matriarch, owned her own home on Cook Hill Road, which she shared with nine children and grandchildren. These children worked in various local industries, including the lumber yard, as farm labor, the street department, or as a housekeeper for the priest family. Their page of the census shows that their neighbors included numerous native-born white families, as well as European immigrants born in Poland, Italy, and Austria. The Niles' neighbors worked as housekeepers and farm laborers, but also as factory workers. The Oaken family were Polish immigrants. They had arrived in the U.S. in 1893. They owned their own farm in Wilson, in the vicinity of the Olga Avenue extension. Their neighbors were all white. Many were native-born, but some were immigrants from Denmark, Austria, Russia, 
and Lithuania. The Jokens, like a number of their Wilson neighbors, were market gardeners who counted on nearby Hartford as an eager market for their produce. Historian Daniel Howard admired the Oaken family's property, writing, Their luxuriantly growing fields, beautiful homes, and fine, spacious barns and storehouses give evidence that scientific agriculture can be made successful and profitable. Other neighbors of the Okens worked in banks and factories, owned shops, or were housekeepers. Farming continued to be a major part of Windsor's economy in 1921. Agricultural progress focused on innovative growing methods. People raised tobacco, vegetables, flowers, chickens, ducks, pigs, and cows. Farms of all types provided work for many of Windsor's residents, as well as food and other commodities for people living in Windsor and beyond. Agriculture had long been a strong part of Windsor's economy, but in 1921, innovations in tobacco cultivation and the opening of the new experiment station, as well as the introduction of new methods of greenhouse floriculture, were exciting signs of progress. Farmers sold some surplus produce to the Windsor Cannery, which was yet another agriculture-related business that contributed to the town's economy. Founded in 1894, Philip F. Ellsworth owned the Windsor Canning Company in 1921. When the United States government commandeered a large proportion of the cannery's production during World War I, Windsor's lot was one of the mere 14 lots out of 500 total rated the highest grade. This was a point of pride for cannery workers and the town as a whole. Tobacco was big business, and the opening of the new experiment station meant progress and profit for growers. In the 1890s, a group of men from Pequannock formed the Connecticut Tobacco Experiment Company. Eventually, it became a government entity. They conducted fertilizer experiments, and in 1900, they experimented with shade-grown tobacco for the first time. The process of growing tobacco in tents drew laughs at first, but it caught on quickly because it successfully shielded the plants from extreme weather and pests and created a more tropical microclimate in which to grow the high dollar leaves used as cigar wrappers. Soon, shade tobacco had spread through the entire Connecticut River Valley, but Windsor was always the hub of this profitable enterprise. In 1921, the new tobacco experiment station opened through state appropriations on 13 acres of land purchased from the old Filey estate. It conducted experiments on breeding, pest and disease control, fertilization, and other topics to benefit local farmers. Nationwide, people felt stress caused by increased competition for jobs when the many men who had fought as soldiers during World War I returned home. As the Hartford Current reported on June 1, 1919, the problem of finding jobs for men who have returned from war service has come to Windsor. Many of these men have, could have returned to the jobs they'd left behind when the war started. But after the war, many of them preferred to work outdoors. The Current explained, At this season of the year, when the demand for help in the tobacco fields and on farms is great, many have decided to spend at least the summer in this work. Others are putting into play new work which they learned in the Army or Navy such as carpentering, painting, and other trades, and say that they will never work indoors again. Windsor's market gardeners enjoyed success thanks to fertile land and close proximity to Hartford. According to historian Daniel Howard, the broad, level fields along the west bank of the Connecticut River, surrounding the village of Wilson, provided ideal soil in which to grow market produce. Furthermore, the area's close proximity to Hartford provided a ready market for produce, eggs, milk, and other products. Many smaller family farms supplied produce to Windsor's local markets. Jane Zukowski Cranick's Memories of Wilson in the 1930s, recorded in Windsor Storytellers, were similar to what Wilson's residents would have experienced a decade earlier in the 1920s. As Jane remembered, Wilson was a small community of German and Polish immigrants who made a living by farming. The three largest market gardeners were Kaisers, Okins, and Beckers. 
They all took their produce to market in Hartford in the early morning hours. I would wake up and hear the horse and wagon with lantern aglow on their long trek into the city. The Christensen family had established a market gardening dynasty in Wilson as early as 1896 and continued this business through a variety of family partnerships for many decades. By 1921, founding farmer Niels Christensen had retired and the business was controlled by his son John and son-in-law Louis Lee Rand under the business name Christensen and Rand. By 1945, the Christensens employed upward of 60 people in the busy season, had greenhouses for winter, and cultivated more than 135 acres. In 1910, as the photo shows, the Christensens hauled their produce to market using a horse cart. The 1916 photo shows one of their trucks laden with produce for sale and most likely headed to Hartford. Progress meant continual change. Some of the paper and textile mills that had altered Windsor's character so much during the Industrial Revolution began to close, and some new industries, like power companies, began to flourish. Manufacturing of various types had been carried out in Windsor since the town's early days. Bricks had long been an important industry. Windsor's grist mill, in operation since the 1640s, was still grinding grain in 1921, but had been completely torn down and rebuilt around 1869. It was updated again in 1919 with new machinery for grinding rye and producing grain flour. The character of Windsor changed dramatically in the 19th century with the introduction of industrial mills for producing paper and textiles, particularly in the villages of Pequannock and Rainbow, where these mills were located along the Farmington River. By 1920, in keeping with larger national trends, some of these factories had begun to close, leaving workers to look for jobs elsewhere, just as Windsor's job market experienced increased pressure from increased immigration and the many soldiers returning from World War I. While some former mills, like the Hartford Paper Company at Rainbow Mills, were sold to and demolished by the Farmington River Power Company, which provided new jobs to former mill workers, the other mills closed entirely, with no replacement industry taking their place. Franklin Mills, for example, was sold to Valley Paper of Holyoke, Massachusetts, which removed the equipment and demolished the mill buildings in 1919. In spite of these setbacks, a number of mills continued to operate in Windsor beyond 1921. Dunham Mills remained in operation until 1928, and several others remained in business into the 1930s, with Stevens Paper Mill continuing in operation until 2013. Many paper mills in Rainbow, including all of those pictured here, closed by the mid-1920s in order to make way for the new power plant. The rise of electricity brought a new type of manufacturing to Windsor in the late 1880s and early 1900s, the production of electric power. Eddy Electric Company, which manufactured many items, including electric generators called dynamos, sold its rights and land to the General Electric Company in 1919. GE made a major enlargement to its factory on Mechanic Street in 1920 and continued to manufacture generators and other products. The Farmington River Power Company was established in 1889 in order to provide energy used by the Hartford Electric Light Company between 1893 and 1916, after which they were purchased by and supplied power to the Stanley Works of New Britain. In 1918, the Stanley Works established a more modern plant at the site of the former Rainbow Paper Mill, which also sold power to the Northern Connecticut Power Company. This photo shows workers at the Mack family's brickyard in 1916. At the center of the photo is Floyd Niles, another son of Susan Niles, whose family is featured in the census section. By 1920, Floyd was married and rented a home on Cook Hill Road, where he lived with his wife and two very young children. By then, he listed his occupation as farmer and was working out as labor on a farm owned by someone else. Brickmaking had been an important industry in Windsor since colonial days, 
By the 1840s, Windsor supported upwards of 40 brickyards. But by the 1920s, only a few brickyards remained. In 1921, brickmaking was still largely done by hand. Max Brickworks did not produce any machine-made bricks until 1923. By 1935, Max was the only brickyard left. They continued manufacturing brick into the 1960s, and the firm still exists today in 2020 as a distributor of brick made elsewhere. This map shows workers standing outside of each of Dunham Mills's facilities. Outside of agriculture and manufacturing, Windsor's residents found work in a wide range of businesses needed to make the town run. Some residents were shopkeepers, grocers, and restaurateurs. Some were barbers and bankers and launderers. Still others were teachers and doctors. Windsorites provided the many types of labor needed to give their town all the comforts of home. In 1921, newer types of businesses, like gas stations and automobile mechanics, were necessary to help Windsor residents keep up with the demands of modern life. This photograph shows the west side of Broad Street as it looked in the 19-teens. It not only illustrates the rise of the automobile and associated industries like gas stations and garages during this period, but also several other local businesses, Hemphill's Lunch Counter, advertising for an unidentified pool hall, and the Gennaro Fusco service station are all visible here. Dillon's Market opened its doors around 1906. It was a favorite grocer in Windsor until it closed in 1976. The photos displayed here show how the store changed between 1916 and 1921. A wide variety of products, including fresh meats, canned goods, bakery items, and produce can be seen on offer. Community markets, like Dillon's, served an important function in Windsor. Some families even sold surplus homegrown eggs and produce for resale in markets like Dillon's. The event shown here was when the Windsor Bacon Trust variously offered children an orange, ruler, pencil, and mini bank as souvenirs for showing up to the anniversaries of their first opening in 1914. The gifts changed from year to year. This desk came from Owen Hayden's store on Hayden Station Road one of several community grocers that were central to life in Windsor in the 1920s. In the photo, you can see a local farmer who appears to be selling some apples to Mr. Hayden, center, for his shop. The area of Windsor life to receive the most attention in the 1921 town report was the schools. The sharp increase in the town's population, which included an unexpected number of school-aged children, had prompted almost panicked cries for more classroom space and more teachers, especially professionally trained teachers, since at least 1915. The 1915 town report had included a request for the purchase of additional land on which to construct additional school buildings next to the existing schools in District 1, District 3, and District 9. The school system was growing so rapidly, it was in need of a full-time superintendent, a role accepted by noted educator and historian Daniel Howard in 1916. Then, as now, schools were used primarily as centers of learning, but were also important centers of community social life. Children used the playgrounds after school hours were over, as did night schools and other groups like the Woodland Club. In spite of this progress, the town medical examiner, H.F. King, fretted over increasing outbreaks of infectious diseases, including whooping cough, scarlet fever, and diphtheria, as well as the increasing time it took to accomplish the required health inspections of higher numbers of school children. This class photo from Roger Ludlow School shows that while classes were racially integrated, there were very few black students enrolled. This partly would have been because of Windsor's relatively small black population at the time, but was also likely influenced by the lack of suitable jobs open to well-educated black residents. In spite of earning her high school diploma in 1935, 
Lenora Jubri was forced to accept a job working in a kitchen because local businesses were not hiring black employees for the types of skilled jobs open to white high school graduates at the time. By far, the biggest school news of 1921 was the construction of a brand new high school at a cost of $150,000. Construction began in 1921, and John Fitch High School opened its doors to students in January of 1922. Until then, Windsor's high school had been housed on the second floor of the Roger Ludlow School Building, now St. Gabriel's, with the elementary grades occupying the other floors. Then, as now, the high school's sports teams, glee club, and orchestra were an important part of the social life of the whole town, not just for the students. In 1921, the town's school report beamed with pride that music instruction had been included in Windsor Public Schools since 1917, and that for the first time ever, each school would have its own Victrola for the 1921-1922 school year. Numerous clubs and outdoor activities kept Windsor busy in 1921. Participation in clubs and other organizations was much higher than it is today. 1921 newspapers are full of meeting announcements for the various groups, including the Odd Fellows, Freemasons, Bands, Choral Groups, the Tobacco Growers Association, the Businessmen's Association, the DAR, the American Legion, and many others. Many clubs had restrictive membership requirements, allowing organizers to control who they socialized with. Thanks in large part to the town's open spaces, and the location at the confluence of the Farmington and Connecticut Rivers, plus the creation of several recreational facilities in town, Windsor residents enjoyed a variety of sports and outdoor recreation, including hunting, fishing, boating, football, baseball, tennis, golf, and horse racing. Boredom, it would seem, was not an option. The Winpock Fish and Game Club property was located at the end of Clubhouse Road, a leaflet put out by the organization, whose name derives from the first letters of Windsor and Pequannock, where its members were from, touted the spacious verandas for relaxing and open-air dancing, basement storage spaces for canoes, and a floating boat deck. Wednesdays were set aside for members' wives, daughters, and their friends to enjoy the facilities, which were also equipped with a bowling alley, large gas range, and running water. In 1927, the clubhouse was sold to the Rhymers Club, and later the Marconi Club. The building suffered damage from a fire in 1965. Two canoe clubs occupied Windsorites in the early 20th century, the Tunxis River Canoe Club and the Quanic Canoe Club. The Tunxis River Canoe Club, unlike the elite Winpock Club, was open to both men and women. The American Legion formed in the aftermath of World War I as a service organization committed to helping soldiers, as well as other members of the local community. Windsor's Gray Dickinson Post Number 59 was organized in November of 1919 and named for Howard B. Gray and Seth H. Dickinson, two Windsor servicemen who had lost their lives in France. The Post has won many service awards since and is still active today. The colonial revival was both an aesthetic and cultural movement that swept America beginning around 1876, the centennial of America's founding. It continued well into the 20th century. Adherents romanticized the history and people of America's early years and sought to bring the traditional values they found in early American life into their more modern lives. In many ways, the colonial revival was a reaction against the rapid urbanization industrialization, and waves of immigration that characterized the decades around 1900. People longed for simpler times and found them in their idealized visions of their foremothers' and forefathers' lives. The sons and daughters of the American Revolution, the colonial dames, and other groups adopted the ideals of the colonial revival. These organizations require members to prove lineal descent from early American patriots and elites. They sought to preserve the status of long-established American families above recent immigrants who brought foreign ideals. Many of these groups actively participated 
in the Americanization movement. Many museums had their start during the colonial revival period. Women's groups, like the DAR and the Colonial Dames, were often the driving force behind historic preservation movements. Here in Connecticut, the Ellsworth Homestead, the Webb Dean Stevens Museum, and the Old State House were all preserved through the work of women's groups and the colonial revival. Windsor's Abigail Ellsworth chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution was founded in 1894 with 18 charter members. The local chapter followed in the footsteps of its national founders, whose stated objectives for the organization were to foster patriotism and knowledge about the people who fought for American independence, and to educate the nation's citizens with a goal of developing an enlightened public opinion. The group were active participants in the colonial revival and assisted, as they continued to do, with historic preservation efforts both within Connecticut, including at the Oliver Ellsworth Homestead, and in other parts of the nation as well. Windsor's DAR were responsible for installing a commemorative stone marking the site of the trading post established here in 1633. In 1919, the CTDAR formed an Americanization committee and organized lectures and reading lists on the subject for its members. The Egan children, whose family owned and operated the Hotel Windsor, often turn the hotel into a stage for elaborate productions. In this image, Lawrence Egan, Wright, and an unidentified friend were dressed as a colonial couple, perhaps George and Martha Washington, and posed patriotically before an American flag. Nothing typifies the colonial revival more than emulating the founding couple and the ideals they modeled for Americans. When Windsor Historical Society was founded on the evening of September 1st, 1921, it was a reflection of the paradox of progress which characterized life in town at the time. The Society's founders were rightfully proud of the town and all of the advancements in technology and social life it had seen since its founding in 1633. They also sought to preserve an idealized vision of the town's past they worried might soon be lost to new modes of living and new ideals brought by foreign newcomers. At its founding, the Historical Society was a membership organization formed of a group invited by George E. Crosby, Jr., who was named president. Focused on celebrating the town's 300th anniversary in 1933, the new group's stated mission was for collecting manuscripts, documents, and relics connected with the early history of Windsor and marking historical spots and locations. Our Historical Society like other history organizations of its day, was influenced by the traditional ideals of the colonial revival and other social dynamics of the time. Our founders hoped to preserve the good old days of Windsor's pre-industrial past. They also desired to maintain the status of an elite group of Windsor founders and their descendants. It was a solid foundation that has served the society well. We will celebrate our 100th anniversary next year. As we acknowledge the many successes of the past century, it is important that we ask ourselves how the society can move beyond the limiting ideals of 1921 and embrace a more inclusive future. When the Historical Society was founded in September of 1921, it was a reflection of the par paradox of progress that characterized the town at the time. People were very excited about the many advancements in social life and technology that had taken place in town since its founding in 1633. The town was looking forward to its own centennial in 1933, the centennial of its founding, and the Historical Society was founded as a way to collect relics of those founding days. And in many ways, the Society was founded to preserve an idealized vision of the past that represented the ideals of the colonial revival and this idealized vision of what the founders' lives were like. Um, so the Historical Society in many ways was founded to preserve this idealized vision of Windsor's elite founding families and what their lives were like. So as we move into 2021 and our next 100 years, the Historical Society hopes to celebrate the many, many successes we've had over the past 100 years of our existence, but also look toward the future and to find ways that we can be more inclusive and representative of the broad range of lifestyles and broad range of stories that Windsor has to offer today. 
We hope you'll come celebrate with us next year for our 100th anniversary. See you then.